and welcome to Covenant Bible Fellowship tonight as we take another look at Scripture. We're going to be looking back at Ezekiel. We've not done this for a couple weeks. Uh, I was traveling and then I was sick, so I apologize about that. But um, we're going to be picking up where we left off, which is in the middle of chapter 8. It's going to be pretty short tonight. We're basically going to be wrapping up this section of Scripture. Um, but let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer and prepare our hearts for, for hearing what it is the Lord has to tell us. Lord, thank you so much for blessing us with your truth. Thank you for opening the word to us and for exposing us to the knowledge uh, that's in there and the wisdom that's in there, even if sometimes we can, our, our brains can't grasp it all. I pray that you would, uh, Holy Spirit, um, convict us with this and convince us with this as we um, live our daily lives as Christians. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so um, let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 8. We ended the last time we were talking about Tammuz uh, and figuring out, you know, why is it a big deal that women were weeping for Tammuz? And um, we discovered that it was sexual perversion, and they were weeping for the, uh, the destruction of sexual perversion, and the freedom, the, the sexual freedom um, that Tammuz represented. All right, so um, we're, we'll move on through to the, the next section of Scripture, which is uh, starting with verse 15. Um, I want to make sure that we have some good context, so we'll, we'll look back um, over the, the last part, but then we'll go ahead and wrap this up. So it says in verse 15, Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. So again, greater than the sexual perversion and idolatry. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, and they worshipped the sun toward the east. So straight up idolatry. And of course, these are not just normal people, these are priests. These are men in the holy place. So the, the priests of God doing sun worship, right? Um, and this is, of course, considered the greatest affront to God possible because these are, are men who are supposed to be dedicated to him who are instead worshiping, you know, another God. And they're not just doing it hiddenly. They're doing it openly, uh, and they're they're performing this idolatry boldly, um, and so this this is uh, the idolatry infiltrating the ranks of the church, if you will, or of course in this day and age the synagogue, but it was the um, the the people of God in a position of authority in the uh, the proper you know religion in the um, the pure religion of uh, of Jehovah choosing to openly embrace idolatry. All right, so um, we've seen a couple of, of big ones. We started, if you remember, all the way back uh, in, in verse 9 when he says, Go and behold the wicked abominations that they do here, creeping things, abominable beasts, idols of the house of Israel portrayed. So in other words, um, you know, they're, they're showing things that are are not cool and they're they're praising it and then he goes even further uh, when he says in um in, in verse 11 it says every man with a censer in his hand cloud of incense goes up so in other words they're trying to get god to bless this um this minor idolatry that they have um, I would tend to suggest that we have a good deal of reference to this in the modern day church, especially, and you know, I, I don't want to particularly attack any one group, but the Catholic Church really stands out to me here because of the fact that they do have idols uh, portrayed upon the walls all over the place. Um, the the saints that that are often prayed to. Um, which is not cool. It's not biblical. It's not scriptural. And they stand there in the house of God and pray that the Lord would would bless this um, this idolatry. So that's the first one. Then he says, um, they say the Lord seeth, uh, seeth us not. The Lord has forsaken the earth. Um, so unbelief. 
And then he goes again to the Weeping for Tammuz, which again is directly reflected with the modern church accepting, as we, we discussed in our last session, accepting homosexuality and other forms of perversion, such as uh, adultery and um, sex outside of marriage uh, in general. Um, as well as uh, approving of, or at least not uh, disposing of, the uh, other sexual perversions which can come up in the church, things like um, uh, the abuses that have occurred, and um, you know, just a lot of different pieces of sexual perversion which have infiltrated the modern church you know so those are uh, all different pieces parts of course the easiest ones to point our fingers at are the ones that that are socially still considered somewhat unacceptable such as the homosexuality and whatnot but all of them all the sexual perversions are are abominations in god's eyes and so that's that's kind of what falls under verse 14 and then we go on from that and it says you'll see greater abominations right in verse 16 which is this open idolatry worshiping a god that is not our god church um, which again this worship of the sun is a very um it's reflective to me of the sexual the the um not the sexual perversions, but of the um, the secular perversions in the church, um, which is to say the uh, embracing of um, of evolution as a doctrine for creation, um, the idea that uh, you know that science is central and that that the scriptures are nothing more than moralism. Um, which is supposedly a good thing for you to, to learn from the, the word pictures of the Bible, but that it's not actually history and that we all came from, from primordial ooze. Um, and that, that is, of course, hogwash, um, but that's something that is openly preached in many churches. So there's, there's um, I believe, the, uh, the, the comic group that I enjoy, Adam Forty puts it best when he says that it's a... a therapeutic uh, deism is what they they call it uh, moralistic therapeutic deism uh, and that's that is infiltrated the church and so that's something that's very bold worshiping the sun towards the east he says has thou seen this O son of man is it a light thing to the house of judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here for they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger and lo they put the branch to their nose therefore will i also deal in fury mine eye shall not spare neither will i have pity and though they cry in my ears with a loud voice yet will i not hear them um excuse me so um indeed they put the branch to their nose so the um the enduring word that we were using last time uh, i'll go ahead and push the link to it so you guys <coughs> excuse me can follow along uh <coughs> it does have something interesting to say about that it's an unusual phraseology to say that they put the branch to their nose um but it was recognized as an idolatrous cultic behavior or something that is uh, a, a ritual to um to you know some some idol uh, and so that's something that is uh reflective of of many of the sentiments discussed here where god is talking about the different types of idolatry and um straying from from the the belief and worship of, of god and the disrespect for god that they show um so he says indeed they put the branch to the nose it's kind of this capstone event um a couple people have different um perspectives on it um <clears throat> saying that it's a stench in, in God's nostrils was one um, saying that it was an imitation of an Egyptian ankh potentially um, connected with plants sacred to Tammuz uh, talking about it being an insulting physical gesture uh, gesture of contempt towards God that sort of thing there are so there are a number of different you know perspectives on it but in general a lot of people do agree that this was reflective of um uh, of a 
uh, cultic behavior and was thus an act that was meant to be disrespectful to God. Um, so he says, my eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. Um, and of course, that's, you know, a just judgment. You know, God does not have to have pity. Um, he always chooses mercy first, but just because he chooses mercy first doesn't mean that he doesn't have other choices. And obviously, you know, once you go past that first choice, if you if you reject that, then you're in for a world of hurt. You know, he's the, God is a consuming fire. So um, we're wrapping up this chapter pretty quickly. Like I said, it's not a very long discussion. Hopefully, Bodhi wanted to chime in as well. Um, hopefully, you know, if you guys have questions or something that that um, that you've seen particularly stand out in this chapter, I'd, I'd love to tackle those. But uh, next week, we're going to be picking up with Ezekiel chapter 9 uh, and looking at, at that and about the uh, prophecy connected there. Um, we should be able to do all of Ezekiel chapter 9 in one sitting. Um, so I look forward to that. Uh, and that's going to be kind of focused on this um, pronouncement of doom, if you will. Um, the, the enduring word says marked for preservation and marked for judgment. Um, so we're going to take a look at that and kind of how, uh, it mirrors some other prophecies in scripture. Um, but for tonight, let's go ahead and, uh, pray and we'll close this out unless you guys have some comments or questions, in which case to go ahead and post them right up there. Lord, thank you so much for giving us your... <laughs> your word. Thank you for your blessings and for your truth. And I just pray that you would give us the um, the strength of, of character to stick to our convictions no matter what. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Go with God, everyone. We'll see each other next week.